So, the whole project with Demix took me over about two years, and we used to meet every Wednesday for about four hours, and we touched upon various topics, and then we decided at one point of time that we decided that uh, let's go and integrate it into a single discipline which can be put forward to the public uh, in terms of putting what we call as a teaser to thoughts of various people. All that I will say may not be acceptable to everybody. That's known. Because whenever there is a unknown entity coming across you for the first time, there always are doubts and retaliations. But let's keep that, as Rajiv has already said, aside for some time, and then follow a thread. And then uh, what we will do is after the first session, that is this one, we will have some time definitely allocated to questions and answers related to this particular uh, session. And when we finish the second session, we will allocate a little more time for questions and answers. Now, keeping that in mind, let's go with the contents. As we have already said that the project Visitemix was started uh, two years back. It has taken us a lot of efforts and uh, every concept that we will put forward has been thoroughly discussed. We will start with something which we call it as technological bootstrap. And the technological bootstrap, unless it was there, we would not have been here and I will not have been here to talk uh, and share my views with you. Uh, let's first understand what exactly is meant by the term bootstrap because uh, unfortunately I have no choice but to use some technical terms. The meaning of bootstrap is that by pulling the lace of your own shoes, Okay, you move up. This is physically impossible. But conceptually, this is quite true. And technologically, also it is quite true. Physically, it may not be true that a bootstrap will work. But conceptually, it always has been a bootstrap. And technologically also, it always has been a bootstrap. What it means is that whatever was developed previously, before time, will be used in a integrative manner to develop new techniques, new theories, and so on, and in turn, increasing the power of our knowledge and the power of our technology. This is what we call it is a bootstrap. <coughs> Physically, it is impossible. Conceptually and technologically, it is very much possible. And we have observed that over so many years of our existence on the surface of the Earth. So. Let's have a brief review of this technological bootstrap. Uh, maybe we started somewhere around 80,000 years back as a Homo sapiens, as a race in the evolution, which ultimately took over uh, as a most successful race on the evolution of life. That was around 80,000 years back. And from 80,000 years back to year 2000, 2020, to be precise, because my references will be at 2020, there have been several phases in through which the mankind has passed. The first stage, of course, is what we call it as hunter-gatherer. And from the stage of hunter-gatherers, we have moved to agrarian society, which took us a long time, very long time. And from agrarian society, 
to what we call it as now where we are in a global village connected far more tightly through what we call as internet and many media now this has been our progress some people even object to that this was a, this is or this was a progress but i will at this moment of time only make a comment that unless we had made this progress the world population at this moment of time could not have been supported so as uh, steven pinker who is a uh, strong supporter for what we call it as progress he has already done a good work on to this including what we call it as a quantitative data as to why and how we have progress so we just keep that in mind and then let us look at two things the technological bootstrap and that we will follow it up with what we call it as a conceptual bootstrap the last gift of evolution to the mankind was thumb separation of thumb from your palm this was one single improvement over our ancestors homo habilis and so many of them which allowed us to make tools before us all homo races were tool users but not tool makers homo sapiens is the only race which is a tool maker and that tool making was possible only because the thumb separated and we had a lot of flexibility in terms of handling material objects in as a what we call it as a weapon and also to make weapons using tools was probably 2 million years back also tools were being used but making tools started only 80000 years back so we started with uh, i mean the last gift one of the last gifts uh, there are two of them which we will talk about one is the separation of the thumb and then through stone tools and then fire fire means i mean the very first tool which really speaking the homo sapiens controlled was fire okay. before us there was no control of fire all races were afraid of fire it was homo sapiens which took the first step to control fire and the moment the fire was in their controls this was the biggest achievement in terms of what we call it as a progress development so stone tools fire from fire to axe and from axe to animal power then to metals metals were quite late in the whole uh, prehistory you probably all of us know what is the role of metals in our life and how that changed the whole scenario of man's control over nature many people think that controlling the nature itself is bad but let's leave that apart then navigation navigation has been one of the biggest technology that man can develop because unless the navigation mechanisms were developed probably the human race would have been instinct in what we call it as the great migration where from africa we spread over the complete globe and that was only because of navigational tools and the tools were as simple as finding i mean locating yourself with respect to stars nothing more than that but and then maybe a what we call it as a uh, compass a primitive compass consisting of load stones so navigation then metallurgy which allowed to allowed us to make composite metals wheel was one of the biggest inventions of one kind for transportation engine which was the next biggest invention because it was the engine which allowed non human power to come into picture okay until that time either it was a natural energy or a human energy or an animal energy but not a controlled energy in the form 
which was made available through engine. Electricity was the next uh, biggest step. I am not going to trace it uh, in great details because uh, our time is very small. And then from electricity and engines and mechanical these things, we moved to machines and, and from machines to what we call it as automation, which was further fueled by what we call it as uh, electronics revolution. Then from it, mechanical and electronics, we built robots and from electronics alone, we built computers and then we married computers and robots and uh, we have uh, working automation almost to the level of what we call it as not automation level but to the autonomy level. Autonomy means the inanimate thing on itself will be able to take certain kinds of decisions. So, and the last but the most important invention in the technological bootstrap was improvement of our communication and that was internet is only the pinnacle of that. Many people think that science precedes technology. It's not quite true. Actually, for quite some time to come, it was technology which preceded science. And later, science has preceded technology. And then, by using scientific principles, we have been able to make better and better tools. And that switch over from what we call it technology leading and science following, the inversion came in somewhere when it was thermal engines and the attempts to make engines more powerful, okay, gave rise to something which we call it as thermodynamics, which was a topic in physics, which was very difficult, difficult. even today, Thermodynamics is a topic which is extremely difficult in all of the physics. Uh, why so? Let's not worry about that. Now let us look at a conceptual bootstrap. And the conceptual bootstrap actually started from the nature script, which we call it as speech. Speech was the nature script. Okay. The moment we had a speech, there was no time lag from speech to what we call it as language. It was language which was essential to collate all kinds of technology, all kinds of uh, information into a single whole and pass it on from generation to generation. Okay. So this is what we call it as a ex somatic knowledge base or exomatic development okay that means it is not now only with a single person but it is with the complete race of humans so it was the language which gave us that power and this was a point of bootstrap okay. from the language then we developed various uh, and since we didn't have the mechanisms of writing or or mechanisms of uh, printing, they were long, long uh, due, but they came into existence only in the 16th or 17th century. But before that, the whole knowledge was passed by using rhymes, okay, and gossips, essentially, and not a foolproof mechanism, but a mechanism which could transcend the ideas from generation to generation. Then came religion and when we say religion, it is always associated with God and it is very easy to say that whether God exists or doesn't exist, it is not more, no more required and so on and so forth. But imagine the situation when you were somewhere in a jungle, in a cave, okay, and with all uh, wild animals roaming around, okay, the only hope that the mankind had that they will survive was provided by God. If that concept wouldn't have been there, probably we wouldn't have had a hope because physically speaking, we are inferior to many, many species. But 
the concept of god gave us the hope okay of course every concept comes with a baggage and that baggage is not quite true but we acknowledge the importance of god in the development of the human race after that religion which was basically commandment based and from that commandment the real challenge to the religion was when writing started okay we are not going to trace it to a, any great extent however from year about 2000 years back developments in mathematics started actually philosophy was later mathematics was first navigation was first okay and mathematics for navigation was still earlier and then philosophy developed and it was the first break away from religion philosophy was a thinking pattern which was the first break away from religion and then we had the printing mechanism and the moment there was a printing mechanism we had a mechanism to have mass communication and then the knowledge started to spread to the masses okay until it was only concentrated in what we call it as elites okay so transfer of knowledge from elites to general public only started when printing came into picture which was again a good start point then experiments science was dealt with even greeks in the older days but the real good science as we know of it today only started with galileo galileo is according to me the forefather of science because he was the first one to say that to question to settle the questions whether in philosophy or whether in science okay you need to make experiments and whatever are the results of the experiment probably you have to accept them and that part of acceptance was not uh, a pill which could be swallowed by many of the for example church so even scientists had to pass through a very rough period in 1600 it was not in easy cake as it is today that anybody can become scientist and can spurt out anything which he feels okay which is the state today so we developed uh, experiments mechanism of experiments science progressed experiments guided us that we need to make theories predict and then make experiment correct if the corroboration is not right and so on and so forth this took for quite some time including somewhere around up to 1920 until quantum mechanics came into picture where making experiments was virtually impossible whatever experiments we can make today they were not possible in 1920 for example uh, the ligo or the gravitational waves were detected only a year and a half back which were predicted through theories by einstein long time back in 1915 so current state of science is however that we probably can never build experiments because if we are talking about black holes and big bangs how do you simulate how i mean how do you make experiment physical experiment and this was the point at which the science has broken away from what we call it as classical science that you have to give up that every time you will be able to make experiment maybe the theories which we put forward should must be logically consistent there are no two things about it but you must always be able to simulate them and then look for the answers because whatever cannot be done physically can still be done as a simulation on computers and this point became available to us only after probably the year 1990 even up to 1990 the power of computers was not good enough to test the theories of physics and of knowledge in general 
a series of rejects okay to any great extent albeit they were simulations not physical because physically we can never test them okay so there was a break point there was a break point both in technology as well as in science and that break point was that you had to give up something which was cherished long time back by mathematicians and scientists okay that you must always get the right answer all the time okay many false many failed attempts not false many failed attempts on ai in terms of language recognition and language translations were done long time back before before probably 2000 okay which were doomed to failure and some of the results which we see in ai today are there only because technology broke away as science also broke away from that very paradigm that you must get a right answer all the ways always all the time the moment this condition was relaxed okay engineers knew this pretty well that you can never get a right answer always all the time and accurate enough okay but you can get accurate enough answers which are of practical value okay science learned that a little later okay but that is the break point of science as well as technology and where has that led us to now okay that led us to what we call it as a bootstrap okay and that bootstrap we call it as a singularity there is no doubt that technology and science has improved our quality of life okay if somebody says that it has not probably we can ignore it the best we can do is ignore it but when we are in year 2017 2018 and say 2020 we're in here uh, we are at a threshold we are at a threshold which the threshold is called as a singularity let us see what we mean by singularity okay and what are the problems that singularity is going to put forward to us to solve the singularity concept of singularity comes in various uh, various uh, disciplines mathematics is one discipline for example a well behaved function for example a continuous function there are no singularities singularities in mathematics relate to something where a function and a function is nothing but a mathematical edifice which describes the practical world so there are certain functions which at certain points can behave in a very different manner they can make jumps they can go to infinity plus infinity they can go to minus infinity in value they can oscillate madly at that particular point and so on and so forth that is a mathematical singularity we will leave it with mathematicians and move forward to something which we call it as physical singularities we will move towards to something which we will call it as physical singularities we will spend some time on physical singularity and then we will look at what is meant by a technological singularity a physical singularity corresponds to events in physical world and a technological singularity corresponds to something which we call it as events or states in development of technologies so first let's just look at uh, physical singularities i believe that i am audible uh, to the last uh, the first singularity that has occurred ever is the big bang okay we don't know what it was before big bang okay so probably the scientists claim that they know but let's forget that the first singularity in the physical world was big bang so if you look at the first line on this 
okay we are talking about physical singularities and the second line as it is at the bottom uh, these are the enabling conditions for that singularity to occur physical singularity to occur now if big bang was the first singularity by which out of nothingness out of physical vacuum which probably is not nothing it is something much more than what we generally understand so out of nothing in a colloquial sense matter emerged it was matter which has come into existence at the point of single uh, point of uh, big bang and that is the start point of our whole of the universe as we know it the second singularity occur this the, the event of big bang was roughly around 14 billion years back that's about 1400 crore years back the astronomical figures are very difficult to difficult to grasp grip okay but let's keep at it the next singularity occurred only about uh, only about uh, four billion years back that means from 14 billion years to 4 billion years virtually virtually there was no point of singularity things were in the in things were forming okay for example forming of the suns forming of the galaxies then the suns and the solar systems and so on and so forth but the life emerged on surface of the earth about 4 billion years back and they were viruses after 4 billion for billion years okay then the life continued and culminated itself into something which we call it as the human race okay the most successful form of the life and we are all aware of that this happened through something which we call it as evolution and the natural evolution also is a bootstrap why it is a bootstrap because that species which had genetic mutation and which helped them to survive better okay the that species survived in number okay to give rise to the next species i mean to give rise to the next generation the next singularity physical singularity which occurred after life is consciousness when consciousness really occurred in the physical world is very difficult to pinpoint <clears throat> okay 80000 years back homo sapiens were there and presumably homo sapiens had consciousness at least a primitive consciousness the terms in humanities are quite ill defined god knows why but they are quite ill defined some of the reasons why they are ill defined is all these terms are what we call it as composite terms they are not single properties it is a culmination of number of properties together and that's why they are difficult to capture they are very difficult to grip so the next singularity as we are talking about after life was consciousness and the next singularity that is looming on us at this moment of time is what we call it as a symbiosis and what that symbiosis okay in the new terminology not in the terminology of the biology because uh, i couldn't find a better word because symbiosis has been practiced in biology by different species okay the same concept probably we have to follow but the species are going to be different so i retain the word what we call it as symbiosis okay so the next singularity is going to be symbiosis now from big bang before we could go to life we had to pass through the birth of a solar system and from life before we could move towards consciousness we had to pass through a stage called as animals where emotions were already emergent and from consciousness before we could pass to symbiosis we had to do a lot of work by the race in terms of conceptual and technological bootstrap and chromagnons was one of the it was chromagnons i, I mean when you took over uh, bad word but um, 
whether we really to go on neanderthalus or not is a question of uh, debate neanderthalus were our cousins in all respect like us okay how were they lost the race and probably one of the reasons they lost the race was the social ties we were much weaker in neanderthalus but leaving that aside uh, if it is cromagnons it is the cromagnons which uh, created what we call it as the real good technological good stuff and and they have brought us to something which we call it is a symbiosis now the technological singularity is the hypothesis i mean this hypothesis was uh, done by mathematician and the forefather along with turing John von Neumann for the computers. Okay, Turing and uh, Neumann were the two people uh, to which we can safely say that they conceived what is a computer, what should be a computer. So he, in 1950, predicted that the technological singularity is the hypothesis that the invention of artificial superintelligence will abruptly trigger runaway technological growth resulting in unfathomable changes in human civilizations as we know of it today and this is what was predicted by john von neumann in 1950 when the only computer existing at that time was probably eniac which was made from uh, vacuum tubes and so on and so forth and probably the Three year child now, which possesses the mobile, is at least several orders of magnitude powerful than that computer. So, to give you just an idea as to where we have been from 1950. So this was predicted by John von Neumann. So let's look at it a little more carefully. What we mean by a singularity. Now, we have on one side of it. If you look at this graph, we are on the y axis okay the intellectual power or in, in, intellect in general and on the x axis it's the time line okay the green line is what is indicated by human intellect it is the green line which is the human intellect and here is a date 1950 if i may state not yeah from where there is a exponential growth in the computing power 1950 onwards and at 2020 probably we are on the verge of quantum computers far more powerful very difficult it is very difficult to describe the power but far more powerful than we can imagine at this moment of time now to give you some idea how powerful they were or not they were they are uh, let's look at uh, two super computers one is known as deep blue which was designed by ibm and it was the deep blue which beat garika swarov in 1996 in chess conclusively defeated until that time it was believed that chess is one human activity where machine can never beat a human being okay but that happened in 1996 and also deep mind which was designed by the google team and it beat a go champion go is a game again like chess is a game go is a game go is a much uh, much difficult game because it has far more possibilities that can be in the game than what we have in the chess and it was les adol was the human go champion and he was bet in year 2017 that's a year back by deep mind so that's the kind of the power that the machines now possess this is awesome this is awesome so the point of singularity is the point where the machine intellect is going to overtake the human intellect 
If you look at the human intellect, it has been growing steadily, a little better than a linear growth, okay? And the machines started or computers started in 1950 and within probably 75 years, they are already going to overtake us in intellectual activities. Now, a point of bootstrap can be variously be variously defined. It is the it is the point where the human culture, okay, is going to be no more is going to remain no more like a culture which we had been uh, experiencing even through our lives, okay. My as far as my grandfather is concerned, probably nothing happened in his life. As far as my father is concerned, probably telephones had entered. As far as I am concerned, probably when I was a 22 year kid, okay, the computers were barely there. The chip which I held onto my hand in year somewhere around in 1973 was an operational amplifier, which costed that time 50 rupees. Okay, and 50 rupees had a lot of value that time. And now probably in the same size, probably I have an unbelievable power in computing. So I have moved, fortunately, I have moved through the whole of the technological singularity up to up to this point, 2020. Probably I will survive to see the real singularity coming into picture because it is not very far off. On the other hand, so bootstrap is that particular point. Bootstrap is where the machines will automatically learn themselves to become better and better. They will be able to bootstrap their knowledge and processing power, okay, which will be better than the human power, human intellect. As far as the human intellect is concerned, we have two types of intellects. One is a genetic intelligence and one is a memetic intelligence. Mem is a term which is used by Dawkins and it is a knowledge capsule to uh, describe it in a uh, colloquial terms. It Mem is a knowledge capsule. For example, to give you an example, what is a knowledge capsule? Uh, Feynman, when he started his lectures on physics, he said in his very introduction, he said that suppose one day the whole of the humanity vanishes from the surface of the earth due to some astronomical mishap. Okay, but the life as we know it will survive because it has life as we know it also has gone through this erasures, mass erasures, several number of times. Okay, before we are here. So if this happens, if something of this kind happens, the life again has bootstrapped itself. So what is the message that we would like to leave it to the generations which we are which are going to evolve again? So he said that only one sentence, everything is made of atoms. Then everything is made of atoms is what we call it as a meme. It's a capsule, it's a knowledge capsule. Okay. This was the and then and as like uh, like genes spreading, the memes also spread throughout the society in a awful at, at an awful speed. So humans have two kinds of intelligence. One is a genetic intelligence, and another is a memetic intelligence. And a uh, lot of research has been done on genetic intelligence, and it has been probably proved that we are dumber. We as human beings today are dumb than our counterparts when they were hunter gatherers. Okay. And the reason, the basis on which this was done was that the hunter gatherer had to face a number of different challenges for survival that the individual today doesn't have to face. So the mechanism of genetic selection is no more becoming applicable. That's why we are becoming dumber. There is another research which says we as a human race, okay, are becoming 
more intelligent more and more intelligent and this research was based on what we call it as the iq values of people all around the world okay living the demographic conditions okay that means in terms of comparison of absolute values okay everybody had made at least of a 10 percent or increase everywhere this means we are becoming memetically more intelligent but genetically dumber <laughs> the net total is that uh, we still are able to barely break away from the linear growth in our intelligence and the rate at which machines are becoming intelligent okay is no comparison we are we are at no comparison they the rate is accelerating and still accelerating it's a runaway acceleration that's what we call it is a bootstrap so this is a singular bootstrap and who has brought this single I and mean, who has brought this singularity into existence <laughs> it is we it is our technology which has brought us here together good or bad i am not making any comment on this which we will be subsequently making in the session 2 or end of this session process when people look around such news like uh, the machine says machine has bet cost for home machine has bet the go champion and so on and so forth they get odd okay at this moment of time there is nothing to get odd okay what we need to do at this moment of time is to define the ill-defined term called as intelligence okay now what really is intelligence okay so let's let's spend some time on uh, capturing this particular concept we distinguish between two things okay one uh, a specific expertise and Another we call it as a general intelligence. These two terms are different. At this time, I remember a story. I think uh, it was a Bengali, a Bengali philosopher Chakradhar, if I mistake not. Uh, he was moving through a boat in the Ganges. Okay, and he asked that uh, now, do you know this? Do you know this? He said, I know. I don't know anything of this. So he said, then your life is worth worthless. Then after some time, uh, the weather had become rough and a very difficult situation for navigate the boat. So that uh, Navadi asked him, sir, do you know how to swim? He said, no, I don't know how to swim. Then he said, then probably, okay. I am going to survive, but not you. Okay. So you have to distinguish between what exactly is specific expertise and what is a general intelligence. These two terms are different. Okay. I am not saying that the <coughs> machines will not beat us in general intelligence. All that I am saying is we are today at 2020, we are at a juncture where we have already lost our case as far as the specific intelligence or specific expertise is concerned on virtually any field, any human field that we can talk about singly. Okay, we have already lost that race. Okay, we have still not lost our race in terms of general intelligence. Okay, the machines have to do a lot of uh, hard work still to beat us in general intelligence. So let us, uh, let's have a look at what we mean by a specific expertise in short and general intelligence specific expertise is being best in a narrow domain general intelligence is being effective in many domains these two things are different specific expertise say for example is being Gary Kasparov or Deep Blue and general intelligence is something like being Leonardo da Vinci or Sophia. Okay, Sophia is the first example which possesses a little bit general intelligence. Okay, Sophia is the robot which eventually, as you all probably know, has got the citizenship of uh, 
Saudi Arabia. Specific expertise requires several iterations in same situations, while general intelligence requires breadth, requires encounters in different situations. I missed one point. It requ specific expertise requires, uh, as we know, depth of knowledge, while general intelligence requires breadth of knowledge. Okay, these are complementary term one cannot be replaced by the other acquisition specific expertise in specific expertise acquisition and actuation skills are secondary processing skill is primary while in general intelligence acquisition and actuation skill is primary processing skill is secondary because we have to survive in different situations in different encounters uh, specific expertise is structural richness in a hierarchical way in a single domain in a hierarchical way while structural richness when it is horizontal okay across domains we call it as a general intelligence processing in specific expertise is expand, rearrange, and summarize. These are the only three, really speaking, uh, mechanism by which processing takes place. While in case of processing in general intelligence, it is transform your problem to other domain, see if you have a solution there. If it has a solution, transform the solution back in the current domain and try to survive. This mechanism is entirely different. The specific expertise will require strategies which are mathematical, while general intelligence requires strategies which are heuristic. Heuristic means they may not work always, they may not give me a right, I mean, a correct answer, absolutely correct answer. It may be approximate, but most of the times it will work. And that is the point which science and technology has picked it up because that's the key point for general intelligence. Unfortunately, we don't have quantitative measures for specific expertise and general intelligence. Only functional relationships we know that measure of uh, specific expertise is based on hierarchical depths that you have and measure of uh, general intelligence is based on the number of different domains you know. Uh, I might give you an example to make things clear here. Take for example the word buoyancy. If I am an expert, the moment I hear the word buoyancy, okay, a lot of things come to my mind. Okay, buoyancy means the one which is floating okay must have a density smaller than the density of the medium in which it is floating what should be the relationship between these two densities how do we calculate these densities okay if we have to make it buoyant always all the time what we should ensure and so on and so forth going vertically down if a general exp i mean if i am a person who believes in general intelligence and if I hear the word buoyancy a lot of things come to my mind like that uh, expert but the things are different the moment I hear buoyancy I know I can float I can float or I, I can float the birds can float okay the ships can float on sea okay probably they have a common uh, characteristic as to why they float a thigh floats maybe there could be floating objects without having the relationship between what we call it as the density of one has to be greater than the density of other, other and so on and so forth. For example, I can float by a magnetic force and so on and so forth. So if you think when you hear a word called as buoyancy, if these things come to your mind, you are a generalist. Okay? And how to calculate as to when a particular object will float into a particular media, you are definitely an expert. Okay, So this is the real difference between what we call it as 
expertise and intelligence. At this moment of time, I'm going to introduce two terms here. One, I will call it as Rosec and other, I will call it as a Sisec. Now, this is the right time at this moment of time, okay, to summarize something on the frame that you are looking at, presentation frame. If you look at in this right hand, uh, this thing, you will see that at the bottom we have a virus and the strand which you are seeing is my um, genetic chromosome strand which has brought me to the homo sapiens which will ultimately become get may get elevated to a state which we call it as psi sapiens sapien the meaning of the word sapiens okay is wisdom the meaning of the term, the real term sapiens is wisdom and homo sapiens means the species homo with wisdom. Okay. If you look at the right, I mean left hand side, we have we have started with something we like spanners and hammer and this is my chain, a physical chain which has brought me to the computers via what we call it as a robo here, probably it's not visible in this frame, via robo and in the evolutionary chain or evolutionary bootstrap, it was a dog, why a dog, they all come here and then we get into something which we call it as a roseps. That means the machines acquiring wisdom. And on the other hand side, on, on the other side, we honing our wisdom to a much greater level. So, for roseps to compete with sizeps, they have to ascend from specific expertise to general intelligence, to sentience, then benevolence, and then to wisdom. Okay, so we will eventually be defining these terms. What is we have defined only what is expertise and general intelligence. We eventually define what we mean by sentience and benevolence and then wisdom. Unfortunately. We do not have quantifiable definitions of expertise, intelligence, sentience, benevolence, and wisdom. The urgent need of the day is that we should, in the first place, make at least a common acceptable definitions of this and then try to quantify them. Unless you quantify something, we will not be able to control it. One thing is very simple. The key to control lies in quantification. And we forget forget control over these terms or these characteristics. We don't have even definitions for this. That's the dismal state of what we call it as humanity today. We need to change that very urgently if we have to deal with something which we call it as a technological bootstrap. Else <coughs> The result is going to be clear that the roseps will overtake us, okay? or we will say machines will overtake Homo sapiens. If we don't want to, that to happen, we need to act fast and act really fast. Now, this is the part we are we have started refining our understanding of the problem that is facing us okay how urgent is this okay people think oh forget it it is not going to happen in my lifetime okay and if it is not going to happen in my son's lifetime or my grandson's lifetime yes forget it okay. if humanity had forgotten this okay the race would not have survived there are two biological pursuits which nature has given to us. One is survival of the self and second survival of the race. Okay. What is at stake is not survival of the self. Okay. We have done much better by technology as far as survival of the self is concerned. But while doing so, we have to come to a state where the survival of the race is at stake. Okay, this is the point of singularity. Now, in order to 
give it still a little flesh as we call it okay we will move through three more slides here one will call it as walks of life and then we will look into something which is called as internal world and something which we will call it as external world and then collate all these things together in a problem definition the walks of life we have two worlds within as we know it this is from an individual's point of view we have two worlds one is an internal world which is a subjective world and one is an external world which we call sometimes call it as objective world okay there are little differences between subjective world and internal world there are and as also objective world and uh, external world let's leave it at this point of time we we roughly understand what we mean by that now the philosophy oh, sorry technology which we develop and the technological good stuff via tools and fire okay and the philosophy which we develop and the conceptual good stuff via speed and printing okay philosophy and technology culminated into a science and it was technology which was ahead philosophy which was ahead then science is ahead and now technology and philosophy are lagging technology is not so much lagging philosophy is lagging a bit philosophy is lagging quite a bit now which never was there okay so we call that culminated into science and then we through science and through the conceptual bootstrap we developed something which we call as the axiomatic knowledge base which we talked about and we developed something which we call at axiomatic technology base that means whatever technology we develop today okay it's passed generation to generation okay this is what we mean by axiomatic term the walks of life do not only end into something which we call it as philosophy science and technology which have much much more than that uh, every person every individual has pursuits which we call it as human pursuits okay and what are these human pursuits okay could be a lot of debate on that but people think that since there could be debate on a concept okay a concept can never be defined but i believe that even though there are debates there are certain things which we call it is a common denominator which will be agreed upon by all they cannot dare to say that this is not a pursuit okay they can say that a certain thing is not a pursuit but there are definitely certain things which everybody will agree to which we call it as human pursuits one of the human pursuits okay is survival and when we talk about survival we are not talking about only survival of the self we are talking about the survival of the self and survival of the race okay and from this individual pursuit we can split we can create a tree of smaller pursuits okay and so on and so on these are our guidelines for our behavior or, or living the life okay these are the guidelines for living the life in a certain way similarly after survival comes pleasure if there is no if the survival is at stake there is no question of pleasure i mean this was pretty nicely expressed by uh, what we call it is hierarchy of needs by maslow okay uh, let's not go into that uh, we have the pleasure needs and pleasure needs also can be split into a tree of sub goals or sub pursuits and then virtues virtues correspond to something which dictate us that we follow certain kinds of social norms okay and social behavior social norms i mean adhering to social behavior social norms is called as uh, virtues and freedom and i mean human likes to be in a group okay one of the reason why human wants to remain in a group okay has a biological basis or a evolutionary basis in a group you are more safe you have better security in a group you have better security okay 
that means you can fight against um, calamities in a much better fashion so but at the same time if if you are in a group that poses certain kinds of uh, constraint restraints on you and at the same time you want that you should have freedom okay and a lot of uh, freedom hypes have been there recently need to be verified but we have human pursuits it is the human pursuits pursuits are different and values are different value is a different entity altogether okay in all subsequent uh, presentation uh, we will be talking again and again about two values okay one we will call it as a personal quality of life the two values which are important to us one is a personal quality of life and other is a social quality of life and the social pursuits probably could be providing stress free life for all through abundance security freedom and governance so this is the social context in which okay uh, we have to deal with the technological singularity now the next two slides which i am going to cover are going to take me a little more time for each of these one will be what we call is the internal world and the other we i'll call it as an external world let's go and have a look at what we mean by the internal world physically the internal world is governed by 25000 genes and 100 billion neurons okay if i am a reductionist as i call it okay what is the basis of my internal world it is the basis i have my whole of my internal world is governed by 25000 genes and 100 billion neurons these are all that is there to this please keep these figures in mind 25000 genes and 100 billion neurons because they are important when we will be talking about the size of the singularity which we are talking about or the singularity of the machine intelligence which has to reach to this stage we have two kinds of world internal worlds one we call it as a shadow of the external world okay and when we talk about a world it is not a static world it is the encounters of the self with the rest of the world okay and they are stored in that particular experiences experiences are not static okay associated with them where a whole what we call it is a whole um, trajectory of things that happen so shadow of the external world is our internal world and there is another internal world which we call it as a conceptual world or conceived world and that is my own creation okay it is not the shadow of the external world all these two terms are pretty important because if machines have to overtake us okay they have to excel in these things behavior is governed by qualitative experience base Quali what is qualia qualia is the subjective feeling i mean it's is a, a subjective interpretation of the external world or internal world is far more subjective and in a subjective world there is no knowledge there is there are experiences the knowledge of of that is of no great importance information content of that is not important the experience is more important experience is a better uh, word to use for the uh, internal uh, i mean for the quality of existing so behavior is governed by qualitative experience base plus pursuits that we have and obviously values which are aligned with the pursuits and on the second side of it it is the cognitive knowledge base and the inferences which we can draw okay to 
explain you what is the difference between a subjective world of qualia and objective world of information or knowledge let's describe an event suppose somebody comes and kicks you in the ass okay there are two things which happen one that a thing which happens is what we call it as a mental kick and second thing which happens is what we call it as a physical kick the pain of the physical kick is far less than the pain of the mental kick okay so the pain of the mental kick is what we call it as qualia pain of the physical kick is what we call it as information okay so qualiatic experience is quite different from knowledge and the behavior is governed by both of them then we have two more things one we call it as a consciousness and one we call it as a cognition these are again the two terms which are ill defined and there is a need to describe them in much uh, clearer way consciousness corresponds to what we call it as there are it's a composite term consciousness is a composite term uh, for a human to be conscious all of these have to be there one awareness of space and time the extent of space and the extent of time to which a person is aware is far more than the extent of space and the extent of time which a dog is aware dog is also aware but its sphere of spatio temporal sphere is far too less okay second thing is that for consciousness you need to be aware that there is an external world okay of which you are also a part but the external world is apart from you being existing there are certain other things which also exist in the world that's what we call it as an awareness of the external world and also the awareness of the internal world which we talked about okay and lastly awareness of myself and awareness of free will this is the pinnacle as far as the consciousness is concerned so if we have to go for quantitative definitions we have to deal with this such a com such a composite concept or such a composite property called as consciousness cognition on the other hand is not only information it is information and interpretation or understanding this is one part of cognition and the second part of cognition is more or less what we call it as a uh, physical basis in which we can store process and communicate so this is what we call it as cognitive components and consciousness component our window to the external world is through what we call senses and actuators the five senses which we have and the five actuating mechanisms that we have this is our window to the external world machines and animals are, are at the lowest rung animals have emotion machines have information machines can deal with information animals can also deal with emotions when if we are on the cognitive path it is not only information it's not only data processed into information it is also what we call it as interpretation of that information or understanding the, of that information and unless we are understanding of information we cannot have a property called as reason okay robots for example are at this moment of time they have sensors and actuators they have they can convert data to information they can interpret the data albeit in a specific domain they can reason also if they have to take action on the other hand 
we have the animals which have emotion and then we have the higher forms of uh, life like humans who have qualia that is the subjective experience which we are talking about and intuition intuition is something which is uniquely human and for machines to possess intuition we still have time we still have time to act before they enter into that zone sentience is a composite concept again which consists of emotions qualia intuition together and we normally call club it under a single this thing which we call it as feeling one is a feeling world another is a thinking world and intelligence is concerned with thinking it is not concerned with what we call it as feeling whether the intelligence is a specific expertise or whether it is a general intelligence it is still a thinking activity it is not a feeling activity now we can raise several questions at this moment of time as to say that if there is no sentience can there be intelligence okay many of such questions will come into picture on the cognitive path we have something which we call it as a prudence and on the sentience path we will have a higher entity called as morality okay which again so right hand side if you look at this right hand side okay it is all uniquely human on the left hand side the humans do possess them okay but machines also possess them let's let's acknowledge the fact that the machines are going to possess them and the last is the wisdom now this means that the wisdom has two angles or wisdom has two things one a morality aspect another is a prudence aspect okay as far as the prudence aspect is concerned machines will definitely reach wisdom now this is what we call it as an internal world and this internal world is going to be possessed not only by humans it is also going to be possessed by machines they are also going to be possessed by rosepians both roseps and siceps have internal world plus pursuits and should have identity autonomy and social rights and the first instance of a robot getting a social recognition social right is sophia people think that ah, this is a unique and single uh, off the beat event okay but nobody knows that this is the we are throwing a matchstick <laughs> into a dry jungle okay where it will move towards we are at this moment of time we are not quite aware of what is going to happen these are only indicators a deep blue as a computer is an indicator a sophia is an indicator your deep mind is an indicator and so on they are not uh, they are not what we call only unique these things this movement is going to gather and exponential rate of expansion now if you look at this triangle which i have projected at this moment of time this shows that this triangle here at this particular point okay is intelligence and it is going down this triangle describes the proceps at this moment of time they have at this moment of time okay a coverage on the internal world is a internal world coverage which is depicted in the triangle as far as the humans are concerned as far as the humans are concerned this is what we have the violet one yes this is violet one and 
it not only contains the green triangle it also contains many more things like feeling sentience feeling morality and wisdom prudence everything is there the point here is the point of singularity okay from this point onwards okay things are going to start changing we are somewhere at this point in year 2018 and we have still not reached singularity we will reach singularity when the machine intelligence will become greater than the human intelligence and it's not very far off so this is what we say internal world and when we talk about internal world we have always been taught conventionally academically we have been taught okay that the internal world is possessed only by humans their prerogative okay nobody else has internal world wrong wrong if this is what academics is telling us okay uh, we need to we need to change that very fast because the rosettes are have already covered the green triangle okay when they will start expanding to cover the area marked by the violet one we will never know the moment they pick up something which we call it as bootstrap ability which a lot of experiments are going on okay there is no guarantee that this internal world also be the internal world of a rosapian not only sapiens but also a rosapiens so this is where this is the gap this is the gap which exists this particularly is the gap which is existing between rosapiens and sapiens at this moment of time filling this gap how much time will be required to fill this gap up is what we are debating what is being debated actively now due to this internal world which is possessed by us as humans there are certain unique activities which humans pursue these are say for example sports is one such activity and arts is another activity and arts is concerned with uh, what we call it as value aesthetic value okay. so sports and arts to a certain extent are human activities products and services is a prerogative of rosettes okay that means all the external world which is being controlled by I mean products and services okay we make them but actually we don't make them now because it is not our human human physical effort that goes into it it is only the mental effort that goes into it okay so products and services is the output of the internal world of the rosapiens while sports and arts and conceptions of products and services is the outcome of the internal world of sapiens apart from this there is something which we call it as meme and a meme is nothing but as i said meme is nothing but an encapsulated knowledge okay and it comes out of research and technology okay research in science in not only science in humanities in science in philosophy okay <coughs> to that extent maybe also in religion less likely but still in religion okay all of them are there okay and they produce memes okay so memes is a external entity memes has got its existence of its own it is not a physical entity okay so so these are the outputs of our internal so the summary of this is that here after words we have to consider that the internal world is possessed both by sapiens yet to be sapiens and rosapiens yet to be rosapiens so humans 
and machines at this moment of time, intelligent machines. Okay, but they both are going to possess internal world, and unless there is an internal world, okay, machines overtaking us doesn't exist. Okay, unless the whole gamut of this is covered by machines. Machines overtaking us does not exist. Mm. They may possess specific expertise. Okay, they must. They may possess general intelligence to a certain extent also. Not only uh, specific expertise, general intelligence also to a certain extent. But okay, something which we call it as sentience and something which we call it as morality and prudence. Okay, and. Within sentience, morality, and prudence, are they applicable to? Are these terms applicable to those sentience? Okay, this is something which are our new questions. These are our new challenges which we have to answer. Okay, so this is it. So we have to understand the internal world very correctly. Okay, I am also working in an area called as Internet of Things, and there are three things. that are essential for a inanimate asset whatever it may be air, air conditioner is an asset for example in there are three things that have to be there communication on their own is first requirement second model of the internal world and the external world which we call it as cyber models that they have to be there and third thing is autonomy that means they don't have to guide they don't have to be guided by any external entity and if there has to be an autonomy there has to be a goal there has to be a pursuit okay and every asset iot enabled asset has a digital identity has a cyber models has autonomy and a peer to peer communication okay we are moving towards that world our next inhabitants of the world are not going to be only plants animals and humans and bacteria and so on but they are also going to be iot enabled devices or iot devices okay we are going to be living in a world of this kind this is the type of the external world that we are expecting to arise in time to come and this time to come is not more than 30 years okay as a what we call as a median projection of future 20 years as an optimistic projection and 70 years at the maximum that means you can say that with 99% guarantee okay 20 i mean 20 i mean another 70 years you have a world of that kind okay it is not that uh, that means people born and not born even at 20s in their 20s are going to see this change it is as urgent as that okay we cannot neglect it and this is the question which was never there when all the philosophy came into existence okay so as we have given a fair amount of treatment to what we call it as what is an internal world will give a fair amount of treatment to what we call it as what is going to be the external world okay? because the external world is now going to consist of all these things together and they are going to affect our lives our own lives what is going to be the external world and the external world world is going to cons consist of objects worlds processes and properties so we we'll put some time into this what we mean by external world this is a last heavy dose last heavy conceptual dose okay of the problem after that what we will be looking at is consequences of this in terms of defining the problem and then in the session 2 we will see what kinds of measures are required so that we retain our supremacy as a race 
we have studied all of us have studied through academics okay and unfortunately the academics or fortunately i don't know maybe unfortunately or fortunately with some new point that academics was divided into several disciplines okay so for example one of the disciplines would have been arts branch the science branch and the technology and then <coughs> commerce branch and so on but for example for example to give as to what happen what happens is to the commerce batch and the technology branch is take look at the technology called as blockchain technology which is the basis of bitcoins or virtual currency okay blockchain pervades the field of commerce okay to an extent where you cannot believe as to what is going to happen many people think that bitcoins are going to be banned they are going to be banned whether they are banned or not it does not matter what is not going to be banned is blockchain the reason for this is that technology is different and a far or superior technology of economic exchange okay but we are not at this moment of time the, the only thing which i am trying to tell is that dividing the academics into water type compartments is not quite so not quite right not quite right at all okay however you still have to divide your academics into conventional branches like we have the physics we have the i mean coming to science uh, we have the physics we have the chemistry we have biology we have psychology sociology economics humanities what what not. to a certain extent they are required okay but they are specific expertise they are specific expertises a nicely surviving human requires a general intelligence not a specific expertise he requires a general intelligence and that's exactly what the academics academics today does not give it to our kids and who are the kids the definition of kids has also to be extended after 22 years we say that he is no more a kid i don't think so because learn from 6 years to maybe 22 24 years and for the rest of the life don't do anything in terms of learning okay and still survive this luxury is not going to be there anymore this luxury is going to be out okay unless you keep up with the knowledge of that particular time survival is going to be difficult so what we urgently need is to restructure the knowledge restructure the knowledge based on the fact that people have to survive in a ever changing world okay in a different fashion altogether different fashion for to which the academics had not even dreamt of so we will look at an external world in this particular fashion so the terminology which i will use will be quite uh, alien to you um, however this is the way i look at it that if you are able to understand the external world it's a much better way to understand the external world okay as we looked at the internal world we have to look at an external world also in a different fashion altogether different fashion there are inhabitants or inhabitants not inhabitants inhabitants in the external world and what are these inhabitants they are passive objects okay normally stones and robots okay to give you an example being all these are passive objects there are live objects okay as per as passive objects is concerned and live objects is concerned there is not much of a difference between what academics has taught us okay passive objects were dealt with by physics and chemistry while live objects are dealt with by the branches called as biology and psychology not much different intelligent robots okay this was not this has never been dealt with as an object in our study and conscious objects this has to a certain extent been 
dealt with in academics okay as human beings but it was dealt with as being human beings only nothing else than human beings the thing is not going to remain that way in another 50 years to 100 years to come so we need to expand our definitions of intelligent robots to roseps and conscious objects to siceps sometimes it may be better that we call this terminology as also carbon agents that's we and silicon agents which will be the machines intelligent machines so these are the four different categories of objects in the world are these the only objects in the world okay still we have not gone far away from academics we are still still we have extended but not gone far away from it formal objects for example a formal algorithm is a formal object a formula is a formal object a formula in mathematics is a formal object an algorithm okay which solves certain kind of a problem okay is a formal object these are the formal objects and formal objects are required to describe the external world as also required to describe the internal world also. Okay? We have a trouble in formal objects. For example, mathematics and algorithms okay, have been with us for quite some time. Okay? However, they are not good enough. We need something because we need a universal language, universal formal language to describe the external and the internal world which we are talking about. We have to make a substantial change in our thinking as far as the formal objects are concerned. The next category of the objects are what we call it as virtual objects. This is new. This is entirely new. This never existed before the year maybe 1975. 1975, I, I, I was a postgraduate. 1973 to be precise. But there was nothing like virtual objects. Okay. And what are these virtual objects? Okay. These are the computer creations. These are the machine creations. Virtual objects come into existence through machines. What these virtual objects are, okay, we will see in a certain way. But before we look at these virtual objects, let us look at it by look look at it something which we call it as worlds. Okay, a world is an entity which contains objects. Okay? It contains objects, and the objects have inter relationships they have relationships between them the objects have relationship between them even even a conscious even a human being okay and a stone has a relationship a human being and a hill has a relationship okay so relationships are static generally static for most of the time static they also can change but they are permanent for fair amount of time permanent for fair amount of time a process is different in case of a process, the properties take different values. Proper object takes different values for the properties. That's what we call it as the processes. A process is different from relationships. A world consists of a lot of things. It consists of objects. It consists of relationships. Okay, it consists of processes. So we have a real world. And what is a real world? Okay, objects with mass existing in world which consists of another objects, other types of objects which also have mass. Okay, virtual objects do not possess mass. That's what separates virtual objects from real objects. So we have a real world. Okay, and then we have a virtual world. Anybody who is addict. I'm not sad. Not okay. Uh, at this moment of time, I would like to clarify certain things. People think that computer games is a stupid research. Okay, not quite so. For example, the intelligence acquired by DeepMind and DeepMu were in games only. 
okay but they more they have no more remained games okay for entertainment they have pervaded our actual life let's in very really everything will in very really the games will ultimately end up into something which has got a bearing into the real life bearing into our life so virtual world for example uh, i do not know how many people will be aware of this there is something which is called as a world a virtual world created by mit not you mit of pune <laughs> mit of us and that virtual world is called as second life okay and that game it is i mean very abused as a game it is abused as a game it is not really a game it's a it's a world in itself and what you can do is you can take an avatar into that uh, uh, world and what you can do is there are virtual universities there are virtual cities you can move through them you can live in a virtual city you can buy an apartment you can stay in that you can go to a college you can go to a college in that virtual uh, this thing okay learn something come back and so on and there are interfaces by which you can move from your physical world and get into the virtual world in the sense your mind will be transported into the virtual world it is not you as a mass will get into into that okay your mind will be so engrossed that you will your mind will get into that virtual world we know that okay the soap addicts soap addicts means soap uh, opera addicts okay if you if you observe them if you put a camera and uh, put it on to them as to well, what are their reactions when they are uh, looking into the soap operas okay we will understand many things that they are no more in their own physical world they are in the world of that bloody screen okay this is what we mean by a virtual world second life is a virtual world one of them there are many such created virtual worlds for example there is some virtual world which is created for a specific purpose okay to teach people okay how to navigate through jungles okay <coughs> through where there are many carnivores and serpents and what not and then is for teaching another good example of a virtual world okay which is used for practically excellent values is for the what is known as the flight simulator okay all pilots before they can fly a plane okay have to go get through a training called as a flight simulator and when he is in the chair as a pilot in the flight simulator he is no more a pilot in the real world sitting in a nice this thing so you can see if you put electrodes in his uh, skull you will see that he is no more in the physical world he is in the virtual world okay and while uh, flight simulator have a lot of real value all the commercial pilots and the military pilots okay have are always trained to this because how can you create situations where there are emergencies and when you are going to get bombed okay from underneath or from overneath and what is going to happen if you are a commercial pilot and if a rudder breaks what actions you are supposed to take and so they are trained in such a fashion it's a grueling training okay it's a virtual world so if you think virtual worlds are only for games far from it far from it so this kind of a virtual world was not even imagined when i was uh, already a practicing engineer when i was already already a practicing engineer so we have a real world or a physical world and we have a virtual world but are these the only worlds are there any other worlds which we are talking about okay there are and one we call it as an augmented reality okay and what is an augmented reality at this moment of time 
at a level of uh, what we call it as game, it is Pokemon. All of us have heard what is meant by a Pokemon. And what is in that augmented reality game? You have a you have a mobile, okay, to turn on your camera, okay. The whole I mean this will show me the situation, okay, and uh, I will see the audience and everything. I move your camera, you think? I mean so it's, it's like I'm taking a movie, and then I can introduce a virtual object into it, okay. A virtual object, for example, of a snake, okay, traveling through this, through the auditorium. It's a virtual snake, okay. When you have a world of that kind, we call it as an augmented reality. This world of augmented reality has been used to a great extent, to a great advantage by architects. They create the whole building in a three-dimensional fashion, okay. The rooms are there, but devoid of any furniture in it. Okay, right? And then in this real world, okay, I mean, you move to your flat, which is still not furnished. Okay, take this thing and then introduce a bed. Okay, you can place the bed in the actual uh, room and then see, oh, it doesn't look good. Oh, it, I must move it here. You can do all that. And in the augmented reality world, you can furnish your flat by virtual objects before they are converted into physical objects. This kind of a world is called as a augmented reality. There is a counterpart to it. And that counterpart is called as virtual reality. And what is a virtual reality? A virtual reality is real objects in virtual world like for example i talked about the flight simulator in case of a virtual world it, it is all virtual objects in virtual world in the real world it is all physical objects in a physical world in an augmented reality it's virtual objects in real world and in a virtual world it is real objects mentally into a virtual world Okay, these are the kinds of the worlds which we are talking about and they are not restricted only to games. They have surpassed that entertainment level and now have become something which are the excellent tools as far as the technology in various areas are concerned. These are the kinds of the technologies which are coming into picture. Holograms is very Yeah, holograms is also there but uh, Maybe we will we can answer that when we go to uh, question and answer session. So these are the types of the world. So we have seen what are the objects. We have seen what kinds of worlds are there. Okay. Now let us spend some time on what are called as processes. Okay. A relationship, a relationship or a relation, okay, is a static entity that can exist between two objects. And the objects can be anything, as we have already said. They can be virtual objects, they can be real objects, whatever. Okay. We have four, five kinds of processes. One, we call it as an entropic process. An entropic process is the process which governs the passive objects in all its forms. For example, is a ball kept at the top of the hill will roll down to the bottom okay this is a process and the in this kind of a process these processes are called as entropic processes where the energy gets diluted dispersed among the various carriers for the energy okay these are called as entropic processes all physical or passive objects in the real world follow these kinds of processes okay we have never been taught physics in this way never okay and what is that entropic process that there are only three rules for the uh, physical objects of the passive objects in the passive world or the real world one is increase in the entropy second is minimization of the energy and the third thing is the shortest path we haven't taught what is meant by a shortest path 
we know that we all know that the light travels by the shortest path okay and so on but these are the processes which go on only the passive objects in real world what are the processes which govern live objects in the real world there are different kinds of processes okay we have not been taught in this particular fashion they are known as ectropic processes in case of entropy okay the structure disintegrates the energy disperses in case of ectropic processes the structure builds up and the energy is concentrated not dispersed all these processes are called as ectropic processes so life is an ectropic process and that's why emergence of life was a singularity okay so these are the ectropic processes which govern the way live objects exist in the world of passive objects or rather real world okay they take energy okay to maintain their own structure so these are ectropic processes they go on the live objects there are cognitive processes okay which will which are related to something which we call it as processing of information into what we call it as uh, from data to information information to knowledge knowledge to understanding understanding to wisdom and so on that particular path okay there are cognitive processes and then there are emotive processes emotive processes are there okay even in humans there are emotive processes we, entropic and ectropic processes are physical to a certain extent i mean we should describe them in terms of physics while cognitive and emotive processes which are internal processes we cannot describe them purely in terms of physics okay all attempts to describe internal processes via physical processes okay are doomed for failure we have to look for different kinds of techniques that it has got a physical basis does not mean that everything has to be described in uh, physical by physical processes this is utterly reductionist view this is an utterly reductionist view okay so we need different kinds of descriptions of these processes they are emotive processes and cognitive processes of the internal world and apart from this we have the wisdomic processes which we will eventually make very clear when we go in the second session of this okay then we as we said we talked about objects we talked about worlds we talked about processes and now we are going to talk about something which is we call it as properties a property is possessed by an object or a property is possessed by a relationship or a relation okay properties change property is a dynamic entity far more dynamic than a relation is relations also change but they change at a much slower rate okay so properties there are different kinds of properties the first kind of a property is called as an intrinsic property that means a this particular kind of a property transcends from components to world or systems which make the which comprises the components and then this system is also in some other new i mean higher system for example for example an aeroplane aeroplane has a number of components okay aeroplane has a number of components and each of the component has a mass no and the aeroplane also has a mass so mass is an intrinsic property which transcends through the object, objects okay and intrinsic property in the sense the sum i mean the mass of the mass of the aeroplane is equal to mass i mean sum of the masses of the individual components these are intrinsic mass is an intrinsic property charge is an intrinsic there are several such properties intrinsic properties the other kinds of properties are called as emergent properties the emergent properties cannot be described okay by something which is called as a uh, by reductionist mechanisms okay for example sodium chloride that is salt salt is a physical entity sodium is a physical entity chlorine is a gas sodium is a metal 
Sodium has certain property. It has a mass. Chlorine also has a mass. Okay. The states of these two are sodium is uh, solid uh, in the state. <coughs> Chlorine is in the gaseous state. They do not have a property hmm, called as saltiness. When sodium and chlorine comes together, okay, and when it becomes salt, okay, the salt will have a mass, okay, which can be correlated to masses of the atoms of the constituents. But the property called as saltiness, okay, cannot be inferred from the intrinsic properties of the components which make them. These properties are called as emergent properties. Okay. Now, one thing also one has to keep it in mind that an emergent property is a property perceived by the super system. It is the human being which knows what is meant by salt. I mean, we, which is saltiness. Okay. It is the human being. That means it is to be just that particular property, emergent property, is just as emergent and given a different uh, this thing by an environment of that particular sodium and sodium and chlorine coming together okay so these are emergent properties intrinsic properties are different emergent properties are different okay all these terms are extremely important when we go to something roseps acquiring something which we call it as the status of humans absorbent properties okay there are certain this is a new term absolutely no new term never discussed up till now i have never seen it through several browsing of the internet there is nothing which is mentioned as an absorbent property like absorbent property is a dual of emergent property emergent property is perceived by the environment or the super system. Absorbent property is a property which is perceived by the system, perceived from the super system to the system. Okay, this is called as an absorbent property. Consciousness, is it an emergent property or an absorbent property? If we consider it as an emergent property, we are new reductionists. If we consider it as a absorbent property, okay, we are neo-mystics because it is the property which is called as consciousness, which is acquired by a individual object, which has sufficient richness in terms of uh, what we call it as components and their interconnections and Consciousness always exists in the environment, which is absorbed by that particular object. Okay, then we are new mystics, and another case we are new reductionists. Okay, but these are the properties they exist. We call them as absorbent properties. For example, at the microscopic level, okay, there is something which is known as dual slit experiment. Probably everybody has heard about it. That the electron decides okay whether to behave as a particle or whether to behave as a wave okay and one does not know why it does so okay the answer to this question is if i have set up an experiment to measure the wave properties of the electron it behaves as an i mean wave if i have set up an experiment to measure its particle properties then it behaves as a particle that means somehow we can also say that the electron has an absorbent property called as whether to behave it as a wave or whether to behave it as a particle okay these are absorbent properties and there are other kinds of properties which we call them as engineered properties engineered properties are the properties okay which the designer wants to be in the product okay for example, we are not far away from something which is known as a designer's baby. Okay, that means the human genome can be so modified in the, I don't know, in the embryonic state, okay, by genetic manipulations, okay, 
or genetic techniques. Manipulation is a bad word. Genetic techniques by selectively sele by selecting some genes that, for example, I want the baby to have black hair and blue eyes, which is a rare combination. Okay. But there is a gene which corresponds to black hair, there is a gene which corresponds to blue eyes. And if we can club them together, somehow we can club them together, we have designed the properties of the baby. These are called as designer babies. Okay, not far off, maybe 50 years. Okay, and if you think that the birth was always to be taken, okay, in the mother's womb, okay, that days have passed. We have seen the cloning happening, we have seen that. Whether it was helpful, useful or not is a different story. We did it. Okay. So, these are the engineered properties. So, these we, we call them as engineered properties. Right? So, this is how we should understand the external world. This is a different kind of a view of an external world. Okay? Not governed by traditional way of looking at knowledge disciplines and we need to make that paradigm shift to understand both the internal world as well as the external world because the type of the challenge which is going to face us okay is going to force us to look at it in a different fashion altogether with that we move to the next part i'm almost coming to the end of the session uh, before I move, uh, we let's talk about external world in two more things. We have, we talked about relationships, okay, objects and their relationships, okay. There are two types of relationships which exist in a world which consists of objects and the objects have properties, okay, and there are processes, okay, which change the properties in terms of magnitude, okay. There are something which is called as connections which are responsible for behavior of that particular system together as a human being or as a robot okay those are called as connects and there are two different kinds of connects one we call it is a horizontal connects which are which are trans domain connects okay and others are systemic connects okay vertical connects which you call them as systemic connects and these are the two connects okay which give us something which we call it as the uh, specific expertise or general intelligence as we call it. With that, this is a different view altogether for what we call it as uh, uh, external world. Now let us, with that, okay, we still have something which we call it as, in the internal world I said there were 25,000 genes and uh, 100 billion neurons. Neurons were responsible for memetics and genes are responsible for mind, genetic property, genetic intelligence and whatever. Similarly, in the external world, we have 8 billion, 2020, 8 billion humans and 24 billion IoT devices. The current situation is we have somewhere around 7 billion, 7.2 billion people and about 15 billion IoT devices today, okay, which are, which pass the test at least to a some extent, not all of them, okay. There were four tests for IoT, uh, true IoT, one, one plus one, two and so on. So there are somewhere around 15 billion devices today existing as IoT devices. And in 2020, we may be somewhere around 8 billion and the IoT devices will rise to 24 billion. This means that the inhabitants of this world are going to be intelligent IoT devices far more than the population of the humans. Okay. Look at the size of the problem that we are talking about. With that, we move to the and we are going to gloss over this side okay these are known as big Qs. we are going to talk about we are going to take a quick review of uh, what is known as big Qs. 
why there is something rather than nothing i mean these are the these are the kinds of the questions that religion and philosophy and science have and technology have attempted to answer okay why is there something rather than nothing that means for example why the big bang came into existence okay why did it not remain as it was why is something continually changing it came into existence fine it would if it would have been static it would still have would have been fine why is it changing is there a purpose behind the moment we call that there is a change okay the associated pandora's worm is why is there for what is the purpose behind this change next since i am conscious i know i am as decart says i know i am a you i mean the only knowledge the only certain knowledge which i have is that i know i am so who am i then is there life after death the biggest tr trouble or the biggest question that the human being has got or the biggest fear that the human being has got is death okay and have i got a free will okay does god exist okay now these are the questions which philosophy tries to answer and religion tries to answer and the religion has put something which we call it as an edifice called as god into the whole scenario and try to answer answer starting from fear of death to which the answer is karma vipak to purpose of life the answer to is getting out of the circles of rebirth and birth and rebirth and or wait until what we call it as day of judgment okay so god tried to answer this okay because giving a hope that there is a life after death is one solace that common man can have okay. but we gloss over that and when we go to science then it started to answer some big questions like are experiences are the experiences which we have are they objective that means whatever experience i have okay for a situation in the external world does another human being have the same kind of experience okay and if only he has got a second i mean what we call as a third person uh, view unless it is there there is no objective world which is existing the there has been Empty number of what we call as philosophical debates on to whether the world is objective or subjective, or there is a god or there is no god. Okay, but none of them has given us the kind of the uh, prosperity which we enjoy today. And if we don't say that we have the prosperity, we are denying denying something which is in front of us. has information to reside in matter or energy only this is another i mean neo science as we call them okay which is trying to put names of the kind that there is no free will is also trying to exist that the information needs to exist okay in a media i don't know what kind of media okay which is not matter or energy okay that means if you ask me science has started moving towards mysticism science has started moving towards mysticism it has lost its touch with reality then the questions which are relevant to us okay are can we decide value objectively okay. is there a universal ethics which is a great question which for which we have troubles okay i mean if we have to make something we if we have to look for an answer which is value based then our biggest trouble is whether there is a universal ethics for which we can uh, from where we can get the values okay so these are some of the questions which big questions which philosophy then religion and then science try to answer and how will we are going to concentrate on a much practical part of it calling it as 
looking at a knowledge system which is value based because that's the only thing which will save us from the singularity which we are talking about. To put it again in a nutshell, theology that is God, which is revelation, death, solace, and self purpose was something which at least it gave a partial answer. It is not bad, it was not bad. Okay, if it had not given us that answer that well, okay, that you are going to survive, you have a hope to survive, we would not have been here. It is the hope which makes. But theology has never given us any kind of social goals or it was not able to deal with something which is known as problem of evil. Okay, in any way, in any sense, the only philosophy which came near to touching upon problem of evil was Buddhist philosophy. However, that also didn't succeed. Then we have the philosophy, not religion, we have the philosophy which, which their greatest contribution of the philosophy was to summarize all these big Jews, okay, and not providing a single answer to the big Jews. This was the output of philosophy. And I am not saying that. It was Hawkins which said that philosophy is extinct. I am not saying that. Hawkins said, like, like religion is uh, a fool. Okay, was what. Uh, <clears throat> so philosophy has not provided an answer. Theolo the theology is too short to provide us the answers to the problem we we are going to face for the whole of the humanity. Science, which looked at reality, good experiments, reality and so on, has a tripped into something, okay, which is neo mysticism and physical reality also does not provide us values. And technology, which is an application, okay, which used to be an application, improved our quality of life, but gave us, what brought us to something which we call it as a singularity. Okay, this is this is the contribution. This is the negative contribution of technology. The troubles with all this was the trouble with theology was all that is attaching a word, what we call it, it's a property called as omniness to God. That is all powerful, all good, and all this and all and putting. I mean, from the point of view of what we call as logical consequences. It all doomed. Absolute. As far as philosophy is concerned, it set out to search something which is called as absolute, and absolute doesn't exist. I mean, there is the point if you if your guiding factor is absolute, you will go nowhere. Science, we started with a good intent, okay, entered into something which is called as infinite or infinitesimal. That means infinitely small or infinitely large. Okay, and when it did that, okay, it created not only something which we call it as new speculations or new mysticism. Okay, it has gone far off. New science, new science in that particular sense is not going to provide us with anything at this moment of time. And then systems or the reductionist people, okay, they, and I mean, what we call as, uh, they also landed up into troubles of describing everything in terms of what we call it as a, a intrinsic property based affair, okay. They landed themselves up into something which is known as twists, twists in the arguments, okay. So none of this is of any kind of a help as far as our current problem is concerned, our current big Q is concerned. What should we do? Now, a little bit of terminology which we will we'll gloss over for the time being. Logic 
I mean, there are several things, several suffixes which are used for branches of knowledge. For example, biology. Okay, logy is used at many many different points. The genesis of logy is experiential knowledge. The genesis of sophy, philosophy. Okay, sophy is intellectual knowledge. Look at that. The suffix ens, e n c means integration of knowledge. Science, for example, is an integration of knowledge. X is empirical knowledge. Empirical meaning thereby we can do experiments. Hmm? And then relaxed experiments are called as empirical experiments where they may not be all, they may, I mean, experiment is a strong affair where they, I mean, the result should be independent of space, time and person. Okay. However, empirics is a experiment again, but hmm, a relaxed one. The, in the same way as we relaxed our dreams of getting right answer hmm, at right accuracy, always we relax that dream. The moment we relax that dream, okay, we made a progress. Otherwise, everything, both science as well as technology was at a dead road. They would not have made any kind of a progress. So, X is a empirical knowledge and ism is a viewpoint of knowledge, okay. We are talking about wisdomism or mix. We will be talking about, we'll attach these two words to that. Wisdomix consists of two words, wisdom, which is morality and prudence together, and empirical. That means we have some basis of objectivity into it, essentially. Some total of this, I think now I am almost at the fag end of what I wanted to cover in the first session. Now is a situation, and now plus 20 years is another situation. Okay. Now consists of objects, worlds, processes, technology, products, services, memes, and human quality of life. Okay, that is our guide. That is the only guide that we have under this, this dimming, in, dimming environment. The only, only candle we have got to, to move through is what we call it as a value. Value or quality of life. Value as far as quality of life is concerned. Now plus 20 years again there will be objects, modified objects, modified worlds modified processes, modified technology, products and services and memes which are new, absolutely new. Okay. And there also will be human quality of life. If the human quality of life now and the human quality of life 20 years, if HQL after 20 years is greater than HQL now, okay, we are moving probably in the right direction. If not, okay, we have to change the course. Okay. So, for doing that, what we do is we project the future. Okay. And unfortunately, when disruptive technologies abound in the world now, it is very difficult to predict future beyond certain time. Okay. Because the, because the rate at which the technologies grow are so fast that they will not allow you to make predictions. For example, it's virtually impossible to make a long-term weather prediction. But short-term weather prediction, yes, we can do it. Yes, we can very well do it. Similarly, what we have to do is, we have to look at the current state of best, make predictions, maybe for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years at most. Okay. After the predictions are made, look at the kind of the world that will exist. Okay. And then see it onto the what we call it as a yardstick of values, okay? If it does not fit what we want, okay, then you have to do something which is called as a wisdomic regulation on research and technology. What we need to do to get out of the clutch of the singularity and the clutch of the singularity being Rosef's overtaking or carbon agent, uh, silicon agents overtaking carbon agents, okay, 
what we have to do is to do a regulation on research and technology and regulation is not new even now there are regulations on the food there are regulations on social behavior there are regulations on drugs there are regulations on entertainment how effective is a different story but we need regulations it is it is dangerous i mean truth and value are different it may be also true that we don't have free will but putting that as a meme do you know what disruptions it will make in the society i can get up kill another person and then say that it was not i i was wired to kill why are you punishing me you, neither you can you cannot punish me on this grounds because i was wired to act in this particular fashion fashion because i don't have free will uh, do we want a society of the particular kind or we would like to suppress a stupid meme okay which will disrupt the whole society together okay these are the kinds of the regulations which we are talking about do we conduct research into such a fashion okay that it is going to make entities which are going to overtake us surely as a human being i would not like to do that of course it is anthropocentric and what is wrong in being anthropocentric okay i would rather be anthropocentric okay but this is only one view point either i would rather be anthropocentric okay than hmm, giving up the whole i mean throwing the whole towel into a situation where i don't act i don't want that to happen i have to find out a way i have to find out a way to have something which we call it as a from an anthropocentric view point i would like that the humanity better solve i am not saying that turn off the technology like the anti technologists are talking about i am trying to say that you regulate the technology if you can create the technology okay if you still have the time to regulate it regulate it to the mankind's benefit i think with that i have presented the problem and the type of the problem that we have to solve and i have also shown sufficiently that the old wisdom is not going to help us in any way we need to find out new pathways okay with that i will open this for questions and answer maybe i have already taken two or some fifteen minutes okay i hope to i hope to uh, allot more time to questions and answers by the end of the second session but today if you have any okay i would definitely like to answer them hmm? we have a limit we just just a few minutes we have a limit we have a limit of time for the hall okay so whatever fits in that time zone